Good. Let's start again. <laughs> um, so welcome to, the, uh, like I said, the sixth Botanical Society Crew and Sandby um, organized webinars. Um, and this time we want to be broadening our horizons a bit um, in, in terms of, of um, our, our um, understanding of land management. So I think from a conservation point of view, uh, you know, there's this un understanding of managing land in a certain way, in a pristine way for wilderness and for animals and plants. Um, but there's also a, a, a different perspective we've got to look at. And um, yeah, the speakers tonight are really going to open your eyes to that a little bit. Uh, firstly, also, I'm Rupert Kloppman, the Conservation Manager at the Botanical Society, and um, it's great to have you all along this evening. Uh, before I, I start out, um, I just want to also bring you to the bring some attention to you is the um, fact that this land management conversation is also undergirded from South Africa's uh, strategy for plant conservation. Um, and it is an, a, a target, target six, which is that there are initiatives in place to ensure the sustainable management of production lands consistent with the conservation of plant biodiversity. So there's something that's out there. I'm, I'll drop a link um, to the strategy in the chat so that you've got access to it. And um, we as a plant um, conservation community um, led by Sandy, we'll be looking at the update because the strategy is a five-year strategy and, and it's, um, it's just uh, concluded 2021. And um, these are the, the information that we use to determine how we take our, our um, plant strategy or plant conservation work forward. So enough about uh, from me. Um, we've got a really great um, panel of, of uh, speakers this evening. I just want to, from a house rules point of view, uh, we'll be doing all the talks consecutively. If you've got any questions, please pop them in, in the Q&A. Um, if you just want to say hi and where you're from, um, just do that in the chat. I know that there's at least uh, one person from Pakistan on the call, so it's interesting to see the, the, the um, range of these um, discussions as well. Um, so our first speaker, let me introduce him, is uh, Noel Utley. Um, and uh, I, the, the nice thing about these webinars is that I get to spend a lot of time with uh, people that, that are really interesting and knowledgeable and um, well-respected. And um, Noel is a senior advisor with the Environmental Monitoring Group, holds a postgraduate diploma in agricultural development from the University of London. And um, he's worked in um, farmer support, as well as um, re more recently in um, providing support to organic certified small scale producers to conserve biodiversity in production. So it's a very integrated background that he comes from. Um, and Noel, if you could um, put your video on and, and start sharing, we're very keen to hear from you all the way from the metropolis of Nivadville. <laughs> Thank you, Rupert, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've prepared a short talk for you today. Um, Rupert says we have some very interesting material coming up, especially from Sissy. So I'm going to try and be uh, fairly short and sharp and to the point in what I'm going to be sharing with you. But uh, the title of my talk is Some Reflections on Land Use Management Practice, Land Management Practice on the Bockerfell Plateau. And for those of you who don't know it, um, the uh, the Bockefeld Plateau is on the on the border of the Northern Cape, um, on the western margin of the Great Karoo Plateau. It's quite a wild area, um, plateaus with deep gorges in between, and it's within the Cape Floristic Kingdom, and it's home to not just Feinbos but also to Roibos, Espanathus linearis. So that's what the plant looks like when it's in flower. And I'm going to be framing some of my talk in the context of a cooperative of small scale farmers that was formed in 2001 to enable small scale farmers to participate fully in the industry on their own terms. Most of these farmers have limited access to land, 
and their tenure varies widely. So some have freehold title, some have access through family rights, some have rental agreements and so on into greater levels of complexity. So there's no one size fits all. Um, when we started working with this community, they did some analysis of uh, their situation and they concluded that land degradation was both a cause of, of the poverty that they were enduring and also an effect of poverty. So as they undertook their task of um, improving the quality of their lives, it was there was quite a strong recognition that sustainable land management needed to be part of the basis of that and not just land management, but resource management, including the, the biodiversity. So there's a photo of members of the Hayfield Cooperative on their tea court, uh, which is in on the Bockefeld Plateau, which is the place they make their rooibos tea. And I'd like to introduce you briefly to Beth Sass. She farms on a farm called Melkral. And uh, like the other residents of Melkral, she has quite limited access to land. They only have small pieces of land that they can grow rooibos on. And as a result, they use the land quite intensively. And um, just to take a little look at rooibos, I've introduced you to some of the people. Let's look at the plant a little bit. Rooibos has multiple strategies to access the scarce plant nutrients. It's incredibly well adapted to this environment. So starting on the top left-hand side there, it has many roots near the surface, um, but it also has very deep roots. And uh, in the case of wild robots, um, the wild ecotype on the plateau, it has a, has a, has a lignotuber. Um, and this is a plant that associates very actively with other organisms. So it has nitrogen fixing root nodules, you'll see on the right. Um, it has a mechanism called cluster roots in common with some other framework species, um, which is a, a mechanism for the plant to be able to absorb Excellent. So as I was saying, this is a plant that has uh, um, interactions with other organisms. So the uh, arbuscules and hyphae, the, the, the fungus in the soil, the nitrogen fixing nodules. Um, so it's a plant that, that needs to be in a, in a healthy situation in order to keep its uh, symbio symbiotes healthy as well, to keep it, to keep it happy. Um, and a lot of a lot of this knowledge about rooibos is quite recent. So um, going back 20 years when the co-op was founded, um, science wasn't really aware of the cluster roots on rooibos. They, they, science knew about cluster roots in other species, but not in rooibos, which is quite remarkable given that it was already a, a, a very widely commercialized plant. Um, in this photograph, you can see a, a, a um, Rooibos under cultivation on the farm Matara Kopis, where rooibos is being cultivated between buffer strips of indigenous vegetation, which prevent wind and water erosion. That was the motivation. But of course, these also serve as reservoirs of, of biotic life within the rooibos production area. Um, <clears throat> Co-op has gone about building farmer knowledge to manage its resources more sustainably through processes of participatory planning and action research, working with a range of scientists, um, hosting farmer's days and learning events. Uh, some of the farmers serve as mentors for their fellow farmers. Um, scientific research, in this case, in the photograph on the right, uh, colleagues from uh, e University of ETH in Switzerland and Stellenbosch, um, but they've also collaborated with scientists from elsewhere. The farmers have undertaken trials and the cooperative has provided support to its members to apply soil and water conservation technologies. So in, in a number of ways, the co-op strives to support environmental, social and economic sustainability. And uh, because land access was such a, a great constraint, it formed a trust to enable broader land access. And in 2017, the trust acquired the 2,500 hectare Blomfontein Private Nature Reserve, which includes 120 hectares of rooibos lands. And the rest of it is wild land, which includes a, a considerable amount of uh, wild growing rooibos. 
So the finance for this purchase was provided by a crowdfunding campaign and the co-op provided a loan for the rest of the funding. Um, and uh, the condition of the loan was that the trust had to farm the land to pay the loan back. And the good news is that uh, that loan has now been repaid as of this month. And from now on the land will be farmed by co-op members, but under supervision of the trust. And I think it's important to say that uh, um, the trust is very focused on maintaining the, the nature reserve status of the property and ensuring that the lands are used in a fully sustainable manner. So innovative approaches are being trialed on the property, including establishing robots with minimum till approaches, mulching, composting, and so on, so as to maximize, so as to maximize the biotic component. And at the same time, wild rooibos populations are being managed on a sustainable basis. And uh, for this, the co-op as a whole and uh, the trust in particular follow scientific guidelines based on research. And uh, the wild rooibos is harvested only second year, every second year in the correct season and only a sustainable amount of biomass is, is removed. And, um, yeah, this has proved very, very sustainable, especially through the drought that uh, kicked in particularly badly in 2017. I've recently reviewed the figures and uh, at a time when the, the, the cropping of cultivated rooibos was at its lowest, the cropping of the wild rooibos was able to be maintained at a, at a, at a similar level because it's, it's more drought resistant than the cultivated varieties. So just to give you some other perspectives from the plateau, um, this is a picture taken on the, the Avantir property, which is on the northern end of the, of the Bockefeld plateau. And uh, this is another private nature reserve that I'm involved in, which is the property of WWF and is managed by Avantir Sustainable Agriculture. Um, this is a property that was uh, rather abused for many years and as a result of plowing, inappropriate plowing had quite extensive areas of erosion. Uh, what the consultant who looked at it described as, uh, as erosion systems, not just erosion events or situations. Um, so we, we have applied a range of different methods to manage the, the soil erosion. And in this first photo, you can see a gully that's actively eroding, eroding um, which we intervened with by putting up permeable barriers and uh, putting some plant material in the gullies. And uh, in four years time, the system was healing and uh, runoff water, sediment and seed were being retained. And uh, I, I was at the site this morning and um, the process is really moving ahead extremely well. Um, <clears throat> so in conclusion, uh, I, th I think the message I would like to share with you is that um, whether, whether we're talking about um, degraded landscapes like this one or productive landscapes, um, such as the rooibos farmers landscapes, what, what is fundamentally important is that the land managers should be able to use their creativity and act with agency. Um, the, uh, the farmers of the, of the Hayfield Cooperative are, have changed their production practices to more sustainable approaches because they recognize that a knowledge-based approach has a lot of value and that it results in a much more sustainable production that, that will be good for them, but also for future generations. And with those thoughts, I'd like to thank you very much and uh, over to our next speaker. Thanks, Noel, and thanks for our favorite little alien there, Alan Zoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate the fact that you, you gave that nice introduction to rooibos because I do find that a lot of people aren't aware of, of the plant being a South African endemic and a Fainbos endemic and, and, and having those subsoil um, arrangements. So thank you for that. And, and I, I think it's also a great that you brought in that restoration element. So um, uh, being the, the UN decade of restoration, we all need to be um, 
bringing that front of mind because it's part of our conservation work. So thanks so much. Um, and, uh, and I know you, you've got a lot going on up there. So I really appreciate you being here. Cheers. <laughs> Great. So our, our next speaker um, is on the call with us, but um, the connection to Matatia is a little bit uh, bad. So we're going to be, we pre-recorded her, her presentation. Um, but um, Messisi Matela is the director of the Environmental and Rural Solutions Group. Um, she has a BSc in Environmental Science and an MSc in Agronomy and, and Soil Science with over 20 years of hands-on experience um, in a truly intersectional way. Uh, I will cut and paste a, a link to her CV because it'll take me 10 minutes to get through it. But like the work that she's done is cross boundaries, above ground, underground, with communities. Um, it really is uh, inspirational and, and a good example, especially to young people on the call. Good evening, everybody. My name is Sisi Matela, and I am based in the beautiful Southern Dragonsberg Mountains in Matatiele. Today, I would like to talk to you about uh, how we are attempting to protect the biodiversity on the communal landscapes in Matatiele. Of course, like everybody, everywhere else, we have challenges, but there are also a lot of rewards. Um, Matatiele is based between 1,320 meters and 2,900 meters above sea level on the escarpment with Lesotho. We have a grassland biome and uh, we are mostly working in the upper Umzimbubu catchment, which is above 1850 meter contour. And that is the area that has been designated the strategic water source area. And on this landscape, most of the people's livelihoods are dependent on the productivity of the land. As you can see, the land has basically demarcated itself according to the physiographic regions. The highest mountains are, have mostly been left alone so that they produce the water that is necessary for our livelihoods. Immediately below those highest mountains at about the 1650 meter contour are the summer grazing areas which are mostly unused now because of uh, the livestock theft happening between the Soto and Matatiele. Below the summer grazing area, we have the settlements, the designated settlement area, which is where most of the people are residing. And then we have the winter grazing areas that includes the cropland because uh, people still graze their residues. And immediately adjacent uh, in the foreground, we have the wetlands, a lot of which have been degraded because they have been plowed uh, frequently and they've been dredged in order to make way for crop production. Just to show the landscape uh, as a cross section, we have the mountains at the highest elevations, then the summer grazing areas, the, the upper catchment streams and rivers, settlements, and where most of the small stock was kept. But now it's mixed farming because uh, the cattle don't go up to the mountains anymore. Then uh, the, the wetland and the big rivers. In general, every winter we get uh, quite a bit of snow, especially in the mountains, but recently we have not been getting snow in the lower lying areas. And in these uh, mountain areas, we get a lot of wildfires <clears throat> because, sorry, because that's where most of the livestock owners believe that if you put fire to the felt, then you are going to get green faster. But also because of the climate change and the, the infrequent rainfall, 
we are struggling to get good grazing in those in any areas and as a result there is livestock everywhere hence the need to manage the resources most of the land that was uh, mostly rich in biodiversity has lost its cover because of the unmanaged livestock grazing and there's competition between livestock and wildlife and as a result the wildlife is losing out because its habitat is being lost we are experiencing severe settlement encroachment and this is resulting in the fragmentation of ecosystem services and loss of such ecosystems and as a result like i said we have a lot of conflicts with wildlife and people and anywhere that people build homes the government feels they are obliged to provide them with the infrastructure such as roads water sanitation and electricity and as a result we find that this fragmentation of ecosystem services is getting worse everywhere especially we are losing out on our very productive wetlands as a lot of people are settling unknowingly in these wetlands and a lot of children are getting very sick as a result because they live in these wet areas the infrastructure quality is affected by the lack of ecological infrastructure or the lack of maintenance of the ecological infrastructure and as a result we don't have roads uh, most of the time especially during the rainy season and our bridges are collapsing and somehow our government or our governance structures have not put together the fact that if you don't maintain those mountains and build all of this beautiful infrastructure below it's not going to survive especially because they don't have any maintenance budgets and as a result every single year they go back and rebuild hence the the apparent lack of development due to doing things over and over and not moving forward and because of the climate change especially we have these uh, storms that come all of a sudden between december and january and we have severe flooding especially in the overgrazed and overused areas and when we have that flooding you will find that even the rivers and streams flooded and uh, as you can see in the picture on the right the river on the right comes from a built area and the one on the left comes straight from the mountains but then the water is mixed and as a result we get poor water quality regardless of what we do because of the improper land uses taking place uh, in our landscapes at the end of the day we have to find out exactly who is responsible for the maintenance of these landscapes and the infrastructure sometimes it's very difficult because the land affairs will say it's the municipalities and the municipalities will say it's the chiefs that are allocating the land so at the, it's very important for us to bring all of these people together in the foreground of this flooded area there's a very big cemetery and uh, you can tell that uh, nobody actually assessed the area adequately in order to make sure that a cemetery is not put so close to a wetland because at the time that they put it there <laughs> there was there was no water but the, now there's flooding almost every year especially because of uh, the land degradation a lot of our landscapes have also been transformed by a severe wattle infestation the wattle is everywhere and it's degrading landscapes it's uh, reducing the land that is uh, available 
for food and forage production, and obviously it's severely affecting our biodiversity. As we know, wattle takes a lot of water and that contributes significantly to severe soil erosion in our area. In the areas where we have wattle, we also have uh, wildfires because of um, the supply of fuel to these fires and it's extremely difficult and dangerous to put these fires out. So most of them are just uh, left to burn themselves out. But what we are doing now, we are working very closely with the rural community leadership to build the resilience. And the best way of doing that is to make sure that we build the local capacity so that people have an understanding of the cause and effect in as far as uh, what is happening on their landscape. Everybody has to understand what their specific responsibility is so that they can make sure that they participate effectively. Because this back and forth of everybody expecting somebody else to do it for them is not working. In 2013, we established the Umzimbabwe Catchment Partnership, which is a partnership between governance, the communities. Yeah, when I say governance, I, I mean the traditional governments and the elected governance, but also government departments joined. Uh, research institutions joined and we meet regularly and our meetings uh, have themes. Uh, one meeting will have a theme of water, another theme, another meeting will have a theme of climate change and so on and so on. And then these research institutions take away the material that we are producing because we are producing a lot of data, but we obviously don't have the capacity to analyze and distribute and share it effectively. So it's been very productive having such um, uh, partnerships with our communities. Interestingly, as a result, we have uh, actually jointly made a decision to protect the upper catchment through a stewardship initiative. And this upper catchment is mostly where there is no grazing and therefore nobody really feels disenfranchised. And that area coincidentally is the area that is most severely affected by wattle. So in order for us to make sure that we pro uh, protect the water resources, we also have to address the issue of the wattle spread in that stewardship area in order for us to regain the land, the water resources, and the biodiversity that has been affected. The overall size of the area is about 35,000 hectares. And through dialogue, we have agreed with the community leadership that this area needs to be protected. And uh, in those, uh, with, with those stars just show the places where we have uh, established grazing associations that have signed conservation agreements. And those conservation agreements are signed also with the leadership of the community together with the livestock owners. As of now, what we have done, we have started the process of declaration of the, the protected area. And uh, as you can see, there are a lot of steps that we have to go through, as opposed to the protection of um, privately owned land. The steps are much fewer there, but because here we have a, a quite a number of people who claim ownership or who claim right of use to this land, it's very important for us to go through all of these steps the green is, uh, are the areas that we have completely finished and we have done those. And as at present, we are working on the management plan, even though we, we, we still have to iron out some kinks in, in steps six up to 14. But by and large, we are very optimistic and we believe that we will get to the end very soon, which is really the end of this particular process 
but the beginning of bigger things for all of us. Um, what we have been doing so that uh, people see the benefits of participation is that uh, we started uh, the cattle auctions in the upper catchment. Number one, to reduce the pressure on the landscapes and the water resources, but also so that people can make income from their livestock, which was not the case previously because most of the livestock owners just kept them for traditional purposes. And up to date, the rural communities have made in excess of 34 million rand and they have sold quite a number of livestock units. And it's also good that it's benefiting women, most of whom stay at home when the men go out to find work. And uh, we have to date about, we have arrested areas and signed conservation agreements with about 17,200 individuals. And when we sign these agreements, it, it's not just the livestock owners, it's every land user in the community so that everybody can protect their own interests. And it's good that we, you know, it's providing some of, of income and as we put it, uh, when we put it as job equivalence, it was uh, equivalent to 1,142 rural jobs utilizing the landscapes, which I think is good for our communities. Uh, as it is, uh, we have uh, those 17,000 signed, but those represent 1,338 families. And we are protecting the rangeland. In addition to the upper catchment, the mountain area, we are also protecting approximately 7,500 uh, uh, hectares of rangeland. And this is the place where livestock is actively grazed. And to do that, we have uh, reintroduced the rotational the traditional rotational grazing and rest is well understood by everybody that that had uh, had been seized because uh, you know nobody really had the energy i guess to maintain the system but now that we are working together the communities and the community leadership are making sure that it is operational and they can see the benefits because their livestock condition condition has improved significantly and they're making lots of money per life unit at the auction. So it's for their benefits. The landscapes are benefiting and the people are also benefiting. In addition, we are training local youth as eco champs. And these are the people that live in those communities, understand the rules of those communities, understand, know the leadership, know the, the residents and therefore they are able to help us and themselves to make sure that their resources are managed and, and protected and fortunately presently we have we are being supported by wwf but we initiated the program with sunday and it's working extremely well these uh, youth what we would like them to do is to make sure that they establish their own businesses and one of the initiatives that they have undertaken is uh, to the sheep and charge per head uh, in the community, which thing was not uh, happening because, and as a result, there was a, a lot of uh, livestock theft. But since they initiated this uh, tattooing, there's better traceability of uh, the animals. And they are also making income for themselves, even though as at present, we are giving them a little bit of a stipend. What we are also trying to do, because uh, we have uh, started sheep sharing with them and uh, the, the communities, but there are no people in the communities that know how to class wool. So we are going to get some people from elsewhere to come and train them. This way they can get better incomes for, for their products. And uh, the involvement of uh, the local 
community leadership in all of the steps is extremely important because they are the custodians of the land and we make sure that all of the chiefs and the headmen are signed on to the memorandum of understanding of the Umzimfu partnership so that we can all hold each other accountable if things go wrong and understand our duties and obligations under the law, but also I join voluntarily. We have established a voluntary association for the management of the stewardship area, and they have signed on, which is a really good, but then it's very important for us to make sure that everybody participates effectively. What we particularly like about this program is that we are not uprooting people from one community into another community, but we are utilizing the young people that have grown up in those communities that understand the norms in that community. They collect the data, we analyze the data together, and then they go back and share the results with the community so that everybody is on board and continues to understand what is happening and how it affects them or how they affect uh, the landscapes. The other initiatives that we, the initiative that we have started is, is uh, the conversion of wattle into charcoal. And to do this because there is a lot of charcoal coming from all kinds of trees and products being sold in the stores, we have a FSC certified charcoal that is made out of wattle, and we have um, presently five groups of youth producing this charcoal, most of which fortunately is being bought locally, but we are also shipping to other places uh, around the country. And <clears throat> sorry, they are making good income out of, um, of this charcoal and they are employing their peers in their own villages. This water management for charcoal and management of landscape is extremely hard work. And what is happening is that we don't just clear it once off. After we clear it, we make sure that the landscapes are managed so that it doesn't regrow. Unfortunately, we don't always have the funding to do that because it's expensive work. It requires a lot of labor, a lot of tools, protective clothing, and so on. But we would like to manage it in certain specific areas and make sure that we don't start over and over and over. That's why we are trying to do the right thing once and move on to, another, to other areas. As you have seen, we have a lot of this water. But now that uh, we are also converting it into products uh, for income generation, people are participating more because they see benefits, not just for the livestock owners, because we, we are, we are uh, restoring the landscapes, but the, la the rangeland, the, there's water resources management and replenishment, but also <clears throat> apart from the direct jobs uh, uh, created through the water clearing, we are also creating the green jobs associated with the water. So there are quite a lot of initiatives that are contributing positively to the community. We have uh, engaged in carrying out a uh, hydro sensors uh, throughout the upper catchment. And we have identified a lot of springs. Some of them are very far from the communities while others are closed because it's, it's very important to make sure that if you capture the spring, then it's going to be used. Again, it's one of those initiatives that we have to make sure uh, succeed because they are going to provide the water to the communities because most of these communities did not have any water whatsoever available to them. Their, their sources of water were really concerning because it was never cleaned. 
We have to make sure that they get water from these springs close to where they live. But also those youngsters have to make sure that they continue monitoring the yields, monitoring the quality. And even us, before we capture and build a spring, we make sure that we carry out water tests. And fortunately, we have been working very closely with the Water Service Authority, which is the, the district. We have so far built uh, nine of these springs and uh, people are getting water from them. They are, they, those that are not good quality are being treated. Unfortunately, we, have, um, so we still have a problem of waste management, especially uh, diapers now uh, are a menace on our, on our water and our landscapes. And we have to make sure that the water is clean for human consumption. Water, reduced soil loss and uh, reduced siltation. And the, the flood damage has been reduced. There's improved carbon storage because of the improved cover. And overall aesthetics of the, the landscapes are much better, which means we can actually even look into introducing ecotourism into our area because also the biodiversity is improving. One of the things that we have uh, developed recently is a checklist that these youngsters carry with them wherever they go, just to record what they see. They don't necessarily even have to talk to anybody. Record what they see so that we can see if there's a difference or if there's an improvement or a deterioration in the landscapes, in the water resources, everywhere, you know, the quality of life of the people so that we can capture the data and streamline our interventions so that they address the real problems that are uh, observed in the community. Uh, I would like to thank you for this opportunity and uh, we hope that we can conserve our resources together going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. C. Wow, so like I said, it just shows what's possible in the landscape and, and um, the real thing here is that we need to be able to understand the landscape, as Noel said, um, and then respond to it creatively using the human and other um, resources at our disposal. So I think there's plenty of food for thought there. Um, I just want to do, uh, do a, a quick um, ad break. <laughs> so... Uh, if you're not yet a member of the Botanical Society um, at, or following us on these various platforms, now would be a good time to, well, not right now, but just afterwards to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, Bartok SA and all those platforms. And um, there's lots of ways to get involved across the landscape. Um, we've got a branch convention, the AGM, coming up next week as well. Um, and a sneak preview actually is that um, there will be a members only webinar as part of the um, the branch convention on the same topic but with uh, a new um, set of speakers so yeah um, go click uh, and 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 check that out as well so our next speaker um, is also from the summer rainfall and and up north um, mike uh, could you please um put on your camera and, and, and start sharing. But uh, Mike Grover is the Conservation South Africa Landscape Director for Kruger to Canyons demonstration site. And he's based in Hoodsprate, working with uh, communities adjacent to Kruger National Park. So um, we, we're very keen to see what um, good land management looks like in that neck of the woods. So thanks so much for joining us, Mike. Just stick it on to presentation mode. Great, thank you very much. Uh, just to let you know that uh, it's not allowing me to share my video yet. So maybe you can. Do I, I can. I can see your screen. Um, yeah, but my video though. So oh cool. right. Not that you really want to see my face, but you, you <laughs> wanted to. Madeleine, sorry, just see if you can. Um, I might have 
accidentally taken that those rights away so just give him the i right think it system. might be on his side i think um i it's good if he goes it i don't think we'll sort it out now okay sorry my okay. cats no problem that's absolutely fine and thanks very much uh, for for the introduction um so what i would uh, really like to touch on today is very much the the land management in, in the Kruger to Canyons region and the complexities around it of what is good land management. Um, and starting off the, the Kruger to Canyons landscape uh, where we're based, which is just adjacent to the Kruger National Park, has this complexity of different land users and land uses. And so with that complexity comes all the complexities of how to manage it. And, and so a lot of the discussions uh, that, that will happen, or the, a lot of the, uh, the stuff that I'm going to discuss today is how we uh, adapted to that. Quite thankfully, um, I started my whole journey on, on this process after leaving the Sabi Sand as, a, as an ecologist. And the first place I went was down to Matatiele, and I, I met Sissy and uh, Nikki there, and they actually uh, sort of showed me the light. So I must admit, Sissy's done uh, most of the work for me, and, and therefore I won't really speak too much about the, the livestock work that we're doing in, in um, the Kruger to Canyons region, because as you can see from this uh, map, Matatiel is one of the areas that uh, Conservation South Africa has got an office and works very closely with ERS. And so our model is very similar. Um, so everything that you heard earlier from, from Sissy, you can copy and paste with a few differences which I'll highlight along the way. But what I really wanted to, to show you is that we have this opportunity to, to use these different kinds of models in ways that, that are relevant to us. So our landscape is uh, in the northwest, uh, northeast corner of South Africa um, in the Kruger to Canyons biosphere. And we, we have an incredible opportunity here because we have this variety of biodiversity, mainly due to the altitude differences and, and the variation. So starting on, on the western side, you have the canyon um, and the, the mountain part, which is the escarpment. Sorry, Mike. Uh, yes. um, you, you also on that, that presentation, uh, presentation oh. display. Yeah. So, okay, sorry. let me switch it then. Thank you. The same way that... Um, let me just get back there. Hold on a second. Tell me if it changes in any sort of way. Sure, I'm waiting for you for that to go. Ah. How about now? Perfect, thank you. Okay, apologies for that. Um, so we have this opportunity to see the variation in biodiversity in, in this Kruger to Canyons landscape, starting off with the escarpment area, which is um, sitting at about 1,800 meters at the tallest uh, site. And, and has a huge variation in rainfall. So over 2000 mils of rain falls at the top of the escarpment and actually um, ends up creating what is the third largest canyon in the world of the Blader Canyon. Um, and is a, a, a really critical part of, of the biodiversity is actually the fact that we have some bainbos species, proteas and, and aloes uh, at the top of the mountain. And, and then as you descend down over the elevation, um, you move down into what is the savanna grasslands and eventually reaching the, the Kruger National Park or the Greater Kruger National Park um, where the, these protected areas are. The place that we really focus our work is in that veterinary control area, which is between the escarpment um, and, and the protected areas. And it's uh, essentially an area um, called Bushbuck Ridge um, and has been an area that is been caught between the two, two sides is that it has the negatives of the, the uh, foot and mouth disease from, from the big five area because there's buffalo within that area and the fence line is drawn and then there's veterinary controls and, and livestock management for, for those uh, areas are, is very strictly taken um, through the, the veterinary departments, so Mpumalanga State Veterinary Department. And livestock that are owned here cannot leave the area. So there is limited market access for these farmers. And essentially what happens is the numbers build up. So the, the similarities to, to the Matatiela area is that you have these unmanaged livestock that don't have really good market access. So therefore people don't value them uh, 
in a commercial sense. So they value them in, in culture, but not necessarily valuing them in a commercial sense. Therefore, the land which they, they survive on is not valued either. And that's where uh, I'd really like to focus today is how, how do we change that valuation of, of the land that they live on? So this uh, sort of complex diagram is, is supposed to be uh, simple and, and sometimes comes across quite complex. But if you can split it into two things and, and just focus on the left-hand side is different kinds of ways that we can manage savanna biomes um, and what their outputs are in terms of soil organic matter. And it's an interest because it's a combination of different techniques or different uh, management styles, whether you have grazers and fire or grazers alone or just fire or none of the, the, either um, fire or, or grazers. However, the essence comes down to what is actually happening with the microorganisms underneath there. And speaking to, to people like yourselves, I guess I don't need to go into too much detail about it, but it's about the microorganisms and, and how they function. So every good gardener knows that you have to get the, the soil to be healthy and you need all those microbes uh, in the soil. And that's what, what sequesters the carbon and does it in a, in a more efficient manner than, than often you would hear in, in terms of rainforests and, and those sorts of areas. Because these grasslands have the ability to have high nutrient uh, amounts being sequestered through these microorganisms. So what Conservation South Africa is, is doing is really working on the idea of getting the soil into a healthy state. We use many different um, techniques and, and rehabilitation um, options, but we try and get those options from what is locally relevant and also what is most cost-effective, which is an important part uh, of what we're trying to do, because often rehabilitation or restoration is an expensive exercise, and it, it's a simple matter that just needs to, to be kickstarted and nature does the rest. So where we started um, after my trip back from Matadiela was to say, right, we really need to get the buy-in from the local uh, leaders, the, the traditional authorities, the municipalities, and, and the people that are the land users themselves. And so we started off with a, a restoration and rehabilitation program where we focused on, on three things. The first thing was the, the obvious of removing alien vegetation. Um, the second thing was the bush encroached areas. Um, while you're there taking out alien vegetation, maybe there's opportunities to reduce the, the bush encroachment through a bush thinning process. But, uh, and I'll go into more detail with that shortly. And then the final thing is, is mitigating the topsoil loss and, and the erosion that was um, starting to, to really create issues in the area and, and the, the major cause of, of degradation of these unmanaged cattle was being exaggerated and, and the topsoil loss was, was evident. So I can't say that Conservation South Africa did it alone and must recognize that uh, the Sand Parks Biodiversity uh, Social Projects, uh, as well as the Kruger to Canyons Biosphere were, were critical in the initial implementation. It was the low hanging fruit of creating jobs uh, for, for small groups of, of uh, or small groups of, of youth or, or village um, community members that actually managed themselves and went out and did this initial restoration work in the alien plant clearing. So it was about empowerment in the initial stages and laying the foundations so that we could get to a point where we could start implementing the, the livestock management processes that uh, Ceci talk, talked about uh, a little bit earlier. And we are now five years down the line and implementing those really successfully. So it does show that these initial uh, startups are, are the way that you can get the low hanging fruit. So alien plant removal is, uh, uh, we, we've all heard about it before and I'm not gonna go into detail there, but what I'd really like to focus on is our uh, bush thinning or, uh, process, or we like to call it bush pruning because we, we really don't want to have the effect that we are clearing or bush clearing when it comes to the, these bush encroachment species. So that the main sort of bush encroachment species um, are, are really thick uh, and, and re, re uh, with a multiple stem, which creates less available grass. So what we've done in, in the Kruger Canyons landscape is we've trialed a whole number of different um, techniques 
to Bushton and really settled on one that was built upon by the farmers themselves and, and the local communities. What we do is we prune the, the tree, as you can see in this picture, um, the branches at the base up to about 1.5 meters. So it's mimicking what nature would naturally do in terms of uh, your fire trap. So anytime you have a grassland fire, about 1.5 to 2 meters is what gets burnt and, and everything above that in the trees remains. Or, or the browser trap of, the, of those smaller antelope that would probably be browsing on, on the branches. So we did it mechanically with, with humans and we were able to, to prune and have this accessible grass underneath, which is often the shade loving grasses um, and it has the ability to, to be higher in protein and actually better for your cattle. We then sort of looked at what do we do with these branches afterwards? And we went through training in different areas and brush packing is obviously a technique that many people know, but what sprung out for me was one day when we were walking through the Kruger National Park with one of our, our local environmental monitors, this young lady said to me, who does the brush packing in the Kruger Park? Because they do a really great job. And when I asked her, what do you mean by that? She said, well, every time she's seen brush packing happening, it's either over a bear patch and it's done in a way that the, the, the animals can't move it away and, and access the grass that regrows underneath it. And obviously that was the elephants that were doing the, the, the brush packing. Yet the fundamental basics of what we placed our work on was all trying to see how we mimic what nature would have done. So our brush packing um, is done in a way that we try to, to put it uh, so that it looks like an elephant has pushed the tree over. And what we do is we, we use very simple methods of higher than your knee, lower than your waist, and bigger than 1.5 meters wide. So that if you do brush packing smaller than that, we found the cattle were able to move the brush packing aside and just access that grass. So the brush packing creates this microclimate that uh, traps seeds and moisture, and it allows grass to grow there. And it's obviously protected. So the grass can grow to, to maturity and drop its seed. And we're creating these islands of um, grass seed as well as infiltration spots, which have less evaporation and reduce runoff. So now we have a number of these different little islands all over the place. And we were starting to see, well, what else could we do with the brush packing? And so we started to put it on the paths that the cattle walk. And cattle and humans are creatures of habit. And so we walk the straight line every time. And what we found is if we could brush pack on some of these um, straight paths, it actually forced the animals and the water down the line to meander and slowed the, the erosion rates. So Again, we were trying to change the, the, the thinking around uh, what was happening. And now many of the farmers, as they walk through the rangeland and they see a bare patch with a brush pack next to it, will actually flip the, those branches over um, and, and have learned this technique as they go along and can see a real change. So this is a, a fence line comparison of the restoration work that we're doing. You can see on the left-hand side at the top is an area that's been thinned. On the right hand side has not been thin. Both uh, are obviously cattle rangeland areas and are grazed. The one on the right hasn't been grazed in that season yet. The one on the left has. So that's something to, to recognize that you have to manage both the grazing and the, the bush thinning. Um, but the, the bottom picture really does show a great example of how both of these areas were bush thin. And then the right hand side one was actually rested for six months during the growing season. And this is going much later into the, the winter season from uh, two years ago when we were in a fairly dry period. Um, and you can see that there was still a decent amount of biodiversity, uh, uh, sorry, um, above ground biomass. So that really leads us to the fact that with this above ground biomass, you have nature doing what nature does and restoring herself, which then increases the biodiversity, it increases the ecological functioning of that area. And in an area that is adjacent to protected areas, we really start to create a corridor, not a corridor that an elephant can walk from the Kruger National Park up to the canyons, but definitely a corridor in which nature can start to, to thrive. So the final aspect of it all is understanding that we are the stewards of our land and people are going to, to do things only if they benefit in some sort of way. And it's one thing to ask people to, to do things, 
for nature or for climate change reasons. But it's another when you start to bring in an element of uh, money or investment that they can get through their actions. And that's where the livestock um, management and the, the sale of livestock really comes into this. You, if you manage your land correctly, you then manage your livestock uh, and, and can get benefit out of it. So we're really looking at a nature-based solution for the, the development of the area and hoping that that will, will catalyze everything. Why do we do it? And, and what are the, the long-term amplifications? Well, if you look at rangelands in Africa, it's about 70% of the African continent that is made up of rangelands. And the principles are all exactly the same, is you need to give time for that soil to, to heal and become healthy. And then the vegetation after some, some resting or with some planning will allow some rest time and nature restores itself. We are heavily reliant in Africa on, on these rangelands for both wildlife and livestock and human well-being. And therefore, we as Conservation South Africa are, are really working to, to try and see how we can expand this and move into uh, a number of different countries as we move forward with the Herding for Health program. So if you would like any more information on that, feel free to, to visit the website and get some more information. Um, and I, I just want to thank everyone for, for this opportunity, but to point out that it is not the work that we are doing that is important. It's the, the structures that are being put in place by the community members and the livestock owners themselves that are, are really encouraging. And uh, I think this is something to, to commend them on. Thank you. Wow, thanks so much, Mike. <laughs> um, so unusually, there, there are um, no questions in the Q&A. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to ask a, a, a question. Um, Messi, see if you can maybe uh, stick your, your camera on and, and, and so forth. Um, and yeah, there we can see Mike's video too, so that's all sorts of. <laughs> um, but before, before I ask the question, just uh, reminding everyone that there, are, there is an after party um, at quarter past six. I've dropped the, the link in the chat to the Zoom meeting, which isn't going to be on YouTube. So if you want to ask some more unstructured questions, but um, Maybe panelists, is there something that you wanted to ask each other first before I go? If not, then I'm going to ask Mrs. the question that I wanted to, which is, <laughs> um, you, you mentioned a couple of times um, things that around, you know, how, how traditional grazing patterns had, had changed as well as that the very interesting point of um, people are burning more frequently because it, it gets green faster, but it's not the right kind of green. Can you maybe just expand a little bit uh, uh, about that, um, that concept in terms of how, how that um, management pattern needs to shift? And yeah, there we go. Thank you, okay. Pat. I think this is a, a struggle that has been going on for a very long time, especially because we have uh, people that are responsible for management of landscapes, but then those that are there permanently are the headers, which is mostly young men who don't have a full understanding of the consequences of their actions, because they know that if they get home and they, the cattle don't look full, then they are going to get a beating. So in the winter months, what they try to do is uh, they put fire to the ferret because that way there will be green that comes faster, but then they don't understand the issue of uh, the, the reduction in the biodiversity. So what we have been doing, we have been collecting quite a bit of data of uh, the different stakeholder groups and one of the biggest ones is uh, the headers. And all of them are basically saying, if you burn, you get green. So based on the data that we have collected, we are designing a program of intervention and environmental awareness uh, and education intervention so that they, they do what they do 
with a better understanding. It's a long way to go, but we are hoping you know to to make some changes and see some changes on the landscape, especially because these fires are started uh, near the settlements where most of the livestock is kept, especially in the winter months. But then all of them end up as runaway fires going all the way up to the mountains and nobody can really stop them. And so that, that we incur a lot of losses as far as uh, the landscapes are concerned. And you should see the water that comes down during the winter months that is full of ash. And uh, people complain, but you know, they don't really know what more to do about it. So it's, uh, it's very important for us to start the dialogue and continue the dialogue with the, with the communities. And the one other thing that we have noticed is that if you continue with this education as if it's just a, a classroom type education, you don't have as much impact as if you actually design your program so that you only address the issue of fires in the winter months, because people don't necessarily have a long memory when it comes to all of these things. You do fires beginning of the winter months, you do water beginning of the summer months and so on and so on, so that you can have a greater and longer term impact. Thanks. Um, and now all of a sudden the questions are coming in. <laughs> I'm going to suggest that most people, um, if you want to keep on asking these questions, I think all panelists will be joining us in the after party. Um, but uh, no, there was one question about um, cover crops. I don't know if you saw that. Um, so in the rooibos plantations, did you experiment with cover crops? Uh, I didn't see the question, but I'll answer it. Um, the cover crops that the farmers do use our cereals. And uh, as you know, rooibos is a legume, so there's no uh, particular advantage in putting other le legumes into the system, unless it's uh, in, in the rotation when the rooibos fields are being rested, in which case there's arguably some benefit for using legumes like cerradella and lupins, some of the farmers use. But uh, there, there are also some concerns about pathogens um, transferring from lupins to, to rooibos. But uh, cereals are useful as cover crops, particularly because they, all cereals are very generous um, rooters. They make a lot of uh, root material, organic material in the soil. And, and above the ground, they provide wind shelter for the young plants by, by breaking, breaking the wind velocity. Um, but as for other cover crops and especially indigenous cover crops, um, we've not done any work in that direction. And uh, rather we've, we've st st striven to maintain what's there and to allow reseeding of, of uh, existing vegetation in the areas. Cool. Okay, so um, I'm gonna cap that. Thank you, Noel. Uh, and, and thanks to all the speakers, you've been amazing. Um, we're going to see in the after party, but I just also want to remind people that our next webinar in um, just over a month's time, because July is a longer month, um, is on invasive alien plants. So uh, it's interesting. There's always the golden threads that run through the webinar. So um, Ms. Sisi and um, Noel and Michael, thank you so much for your contribution. Um, see you in the after party in a couple of minutes. And um, yeah, let's continue this conversation. And thank you to all the, the members and members of the public for joining us from Pakistan, Switzerland, and all over South Africa. Cheers and have a great evening. And also in the third wave, please.